The Australian Surface Fleet Review just came out and it is huge. The Navy is calling it the Enhanced Lethality Surface Combatant Fleet and it will exceed the size of the Australian Navy during World War II at 26 major surface combatants. The proposed future order of battle will be made up of three Hobart class DDGs upgraded with a new Aegis combat system and Tomahawk cruise missiles, six of the nine originally planned hunter class ASW frigates, 11 general purpose frigates on an accelerated procurement plan potentially to be built in Europe, and six large optionally crewed surface vessels. This expansion follows recommendations presented to the Albanese cabinet by a review into surface fleet procurement headed by a retired US admiral. The Albanese government has promised to inject an additional $1.7 billion over the forward estimates, bringing acquisition sustainment spending in the fleet to $54.2 billion in total over the next decade. How many of these ships will survive future governments and how a navy already struggling hard with personnel numbers is expected to crew them is anyone's guess. But it's definitely a step in the right direction in an increasingly unpredictable world. Future Australian Navy Episode 1 General Purpose Frigates The Australian Service Fleet Review came with a host of recommendations. One of its most striking being the scrapping of three of the planned hunter class frigates in favour of 11 smaller general purpose frigates. The review suggested four designs to be acquired through a hybrid offshore then onshore building program centred in Henderson, Western Australia. I promise all of these will get episodes of their own in the future, but in summary they are as follows. Germany's Mako Alpha 200, the same company that submitted the Anzac class design, Japan's Mogami 30 FFM, a good ship but a nation without a long naval export history, South Korea's Daegu class FFX batch 2 and 3, a stronger export legacy but for primarily land-based equipment. Spain's Navantia Alpha 3000. Navantia has a long, if not altogether happy history of exporting designs for Australia. Which of these the Australian government will choose is anyone's guess. All we can do is examine each ship individually and assess their suitability for the Australian geopolitical and political landscape. The German-designed Mako A200, Mako being a blend of two German words meaning multi-purpose combination, is currently in service with eight navies worldwide, the RAN's own Anzac class being one of these and his well-justified its sales tagline of Workhorse of the Seas. Its latest generation, the Mako A200 hull, currently forms the basis of the Egyptian al class. Requiring a crew of only 120, in contrast to the 184 needed for the Hobart class, it could prove a potential salve for the Royal Australian Navy's personnel woes. Typical armament is 32 VLS cells, torpedo tubes, and a 5-inch main gun. The hull also contains a hangar large enough to accommodate the RAN's MH60 Romeo helicopter. Sensor-wise, BAE Systems already has a factory online in South Australia, producing Australia's indigenous CFAR radar towers for the existing Anzac-class frigates, and the Egyptian Navy has equipped their Makos with a towed array sonar for ASW WOMS. Its biggest weaknesses would be the lack of seawiz or hull-mounted sonar included in the base hull, and the typical litigious nature of German defence firms. On the 21st of March, Australian Defence Minister Richard Miles and his UK counterpart Grant Chaps met in Canberra to sign a new defence treaty. The treaty includes closer collaboration on undersea warfare, intelligence and military exercises, as well as provisions for respective forces to operate together in each other's countries, such as the joint training of Ukrainian troops in the UK. The pact builds on the AUKUS partnerships that Australia signed in 2021 with the US and UK to overhaul its defence strategy and respond to China's military build-up. Australia will invest £2.4 billion in expanding Rolls-Royce's nuclear reactor facilities in the UK, these will be used in the as-yet-unnamed AUKUS SSN. These will be built by a joint venture between BAE Systems and the Australian government-owned ASC and delivered sometime in the 2040s. Grant Shapps said the project would create 7,000 British jobs at sites including Barrow and Furness, Cumbria and Derby. Do you think this is a step in the right direction? Feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments section below. The Japanese-designed Mogami-class multi-mission frigate is an attempt by the Japanese to rapidly update their escort fleet. The Mogami contains a high degree of automation requiring a crew of only 90, an essential feature for a nation undergoing a complete demographic collapse, and a radar cross-section reducing hull design using technologies originally trialled on fighter aircraft. The Mogami features an integrated CIC combining the ship's ECR, ComSen, Chart Room and Operations Room via its multifunction consoles and open architecture software. Despite all these technological feats, however, the class has not been without its struggles, with first-in-class Mogami suffering propulsion issues and launching well past schedule. This may not have been the only issue, however, as in 2023 the original production order was dropped from 22 to 12 in favour of a hypothetical future design. The ship also lacks firepower with only 16 VLS cells and a CRAM for self-defence. 
On the positive side, Japan has already entered into a hybrid building program with Indonesia for eight of these frigates, for Japan, for Indonesia, which if handled well would be a big plus in the minds of Australian politicians signing off on the second pass to begin acquisition. The AUKUS submarine deal has come under threat this week as the Biden administration revealed they will only be building one submarine next year in the 2025 defence budget. The AUKUS deal agreed in 2021 between the US, UK and Australia included the initial delivery of three US-made Virginia-class submarines to Australia from 2032. This commitment, however, depends on the US meeting production targets of an average 2.3 vessels a year. Rear Admiral Ben Reynolds, Undersecretary of the Navy, said the Pentagon would be on track to build two submarines a year by 2028. The budget set aside 3.9 billion US dollars in 2025 and 11.1 billion US dollars over five years to build up the submarine industrial base. Reynolds had this to say, quote, It's one in one year and we have a plan to procure two in the out years. We're being very transparent with all our partners about where we are and the scale of investments that we're making in this budget and that are pending before Congress, end quote. Prime Minister Albanese doesn't seem concerned, stating he was briefed by US officials before the public announcement. South Korea has recently made a name for themselves in the arms export market with their massive sale to Poland in late 2023. They also recently won the bid to build the Redback IFV in Australia with a hybrid build plan that is certain to appeal to a Canberra that is chasing a similar deal for their future general purpose frigates. Hyundai Heavy Industries is the perfect candidate for this proposal. The Daegu class frigate, an evolution of the previous Incheon design. At 2,800 tons, it is certainly one of the smaller designs being considered by the Albanese government, but with a hangar big enough for an MH60 Romeo, 5-inch main gun, 16 KVLS cells, Seawiz, 8 surface-to-surface -surface missiles, hull-mounted and towed array sonar, it punches well above its weight. ASW prowess, however, may be its Achilles heel, as Australia has already begun construction of the Hunter-class ASW frigate, and with the Daegu already having to modify its existing KVLS for the standard Mark 41 system utilised by the RAN, it may prove too much of a capability overlap for an acquisition team looking to procure a product with the minimum redesign work required. If one were to look at military procurement like a video game, they would immediately ask the question, why frigates? This is just a mediocre destroyer, they would opine. Look at its small size, low top speed, small main gun, meagre VLS cell count, lack of hull mounted or towed array sonar, the list goes on. Most frigates have weaker sensors, limited in range or fidelity, leaving the area air defence roles to their larger cousins. But a frigate can do one thing better than any other class of ship in today or yesterday's navies. Presence. The ocean is a big place, and no nation can build enough destroyers or cruisers to cover all of the space that you need. A frigate can fly the flag off the coast of any country in the world for half the cost of a destroyer, with enough weaponry to protect themselves and any support vessels they may require. In wartime, frigates fulfill the vital role of convoy escort and offshore patrol duties, freeing up the heavy hitters to dish it out in the contested zone. This is why frigates have been a vital part of all the world's navies since the age of sail. In early 2023, Navantia, Austal and Sivmec made an offer to the Australian government that in hindsight seems eerily prescient. The offer was for a 3,000 ton Corvette based on the mature Alpha 3000 design already in service with Venezuelan and Saudi Arabian navies. With 16 Mark 41 VLS cells, a 5 inch main gun, 16 naval strike missiles, 6 ship launch torpedoes and a close in weapon system. For sensors, it will use the well tested combination of Saab Mark 3 Echo combat system and the indigenous CFAR phased array radar, with towed array sonar and MH60 Romeo for anti submarine warfare all to be built in the now review recommended Henderson shipyards in Western Australia. Navantia has already cemented a place in the Australian procurement sphere, having supplied the designs for the Canberra class LHDs, Hobart class destroyers and supply class auxiliary oilers. And while delivery of these systems hasn't been flawless, given the time sensitive nature of the procurement process and the experience of Navantia shipbuilders, it may prove the only feasible option in the end. The 2024 Indian defence budget just came out and India has a huge problem. The Modi government released their 2024 defense budget, which on the surface looks amazing at 74 billion US dollars, a 9.4% increase over last year. But it's hiding a huge secret that is leaving the Indian military further and further behind other countries every year. It's pensions. 23% of the Indian military budget every year goes to former servicemen and women. Minus is 23% leaves them with the defense budget under that of the United Kingdom, a pitiful amount given the border they're asked to defend against Pakistan and China. This ends up being around 0.4 of the entire country's GDP, a huge stat and one that's only going to increase every single year. So, what will India do to prevent this? No clear path exists, but something definitely has to be done, and soon.
The Australian government has finally put into print how it plans to foster and sustain Australia's Indigenous defence industry in this year's Defence Industry Development Strategy. The report highlights global defence trends, pointing to the record-breaking amount spent globally, 2.24 trillion US dollars, and the 45% increase to military spending in the Indo-Pacific region specifically, as reasons to build redundancy and resilience in their supply chain, while increasing defence capability. Quote, Australia needs to grow its defence capability and therefore sovereign defence industrial base, in areas of strategic priority, particularly when considering Australia's diminishing geographic advantage. Once an asset due to its remoteness and separation from the rest of the world, Australia's geography is less relevant in the face of capability advancement and new threats." End quote. This paragraph highlights an understanding of just how isolated Australia is at the southern tip of the Indo-Pacific. Aside from the breathtaking might of the New Zealand Defence Force, we are separated from our allies by a massive stretch of vulnerable ocean, and surrounded by countries unwilling to commit to a side. The Nine Dash Line is a territorial claim made by the People's Republic of China over almost the entirety of the South China Sea and the Republic of China also known as Taiwan. The claim's origin stems from maps drafted by the Nationalist Chinese Water and Land Committee in 1935. When the Communist Party under Mao Zedong finally drove their rivals out of the mainland, they inherited the borders drawn up by the Nationalists. Unfortunately for Xi Jinping, the current leader of the PRC, all the countries, including China, bordering the claim Nine Dash Line are signatories of the United Nations Convention of the Laws of the Sea. Yunclos recognises a set distance off a country's coastline as its sovereign seas, disregarding historical claims. China, despite being a signatory, denies this treating the South China Sea as their own private lake and treating other countries as trying to exercise their sovereign right as heinous aggressors. This is why warships continually exercise their right to freedom of navigation through the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait to demonstrate that these are still, and will forever be, free international waters. A striking change in the 2024 industry strategy is the revised prerequisite to be considered a part of Australia's sovereign defence industry, requiring only an Australian business number, not Australian ownership. It also relinquishes the idea that Australia's defence industrial base will ever be truly self-reliant, a grudging acknowledgement that you can't pull a developed Taiwan-level semiconductor industry out of nowhere overnight with just press conferences. The government also promises targeted support for companies to integrate sovereign defence capability into existing and future defence procurements, including some areas that in their own words may not be commercially viable. Quote, this will include, where appropriate, investing in domestic manufacturing capabilities. Decisions will be made deliberately and be based on factors such as national security and value for money. Outside of priority areas, the Australian Industrial Capability Program will consider Australian businesses on a competitive basis, end quote. A slippery slope for a country only narrowly avoiding a recession in 2024 and finally facing the long-term effects of the COVID pandemic. Australian Deputy Prime Minister declares recent surface fleet expansion will protect against future Chinese coercion. On the 20th of Feb, the Albanese government announced it was expanding the Australian surface fleet to 26 vessels, the largest it has been since the end of World War II. The very next day, Deputy Prime Minister Richard Miles declared that this was a critical step in order to protect Australia from Chinese coercion, stating, It's not that anyone is imagining that Australia is going to be invaded. There's a whole lot of damage that can be done to Australia before anyone would need to set foot on our shores. And he has good reason to be worried, as in 2020, the Chinese Navy officially overtook their US rivals and became the largest in the world. And the political rhetoric has made it abundantly clear this force is not for self-defence. Xi Jinping declaring in a 2022 speech aimed at Taiwan, we will never promise to renounce the use of force, and we reserve the option of taking all measures necessary. And if you doubt their capacity to exercise soft power, I urge you to read about the events taking place around the second Thomas Shoal, a rich fishing resource located within Filipino territorial waters. The Australian government has identified seven sovereign defence industrial priorities to guide Australian procurement until the end of the decade. While acknowledging they are constrained by absolute scale, the rate at which it can adapt or grow, and an inability to be completely self-reliant. These are maintenance, repair, overhaul and upgrade of Australian Defence Force aircraft, continuous shipbuilding and sustainment, sustainment and enhancement of the combined arms land system, domestic manufacture of guided weapons, explosive ordnance and munitions, development and integration of autonomous systems, integration and enhancement of battle space awareness and management systems, Test and evaluation, certification and systems assurance. Someone in defence has clearly been paying attention to the dramas plaguing the US and European armament industry in attempting to supply Ukraine. As they stress all material capabilities must be able to scale rapidly in times of need, enable the creation and integration of emerging innovative capabilities to maintain our capability edge, and deliver asymmetrical advantage. 
The wise man will learn from the experience of others. Those words were spoken by naval historian John Knox Lawton in 1878. He continues, So also will he learn the art of commanding ships or fleets from the history of his great predecessors. Lawton was not idly chiding the naval officers of his day to read more about Nelson, but touching on the fundamental truth that all military theory is based on the past. If you subscribe to the definition of theory as the fundamental constants of war, unaffected by time or technology, then history must be the focal point for any theory relating to the conduct of war. Clausewitzian constants such as friction and its lubrication by intelligence gathering, planning and good logistics are just as relevant now in the age of the UAV, satellite reconnaissance and ICBMs as they were in 1832. So please, if you at all consider yourself a professional in this ever-evolving, yet strikingly similar art we call warfare, read your Clausewitz, your Mahan, your Julius Caesar and your Thucydides. Australia recently purchased the Tomahawk cruise missile, here's what it can do. In March 2023, the Albanese government approved the purchase of 200 Tomahawk Block 5 land attack cruise missiles for its Hobart-class destroyers from the United States for $1.3 billion. The Tomahawk cruise missile has an officially announced maximum range of 1,500 kilometres. For my Australian listeners, that's from Brisbane Airport to Melbourne. And for my American listeners, that's about 16 million cheeseburgers stacked on top of each other. It has a maximum speed of Mark 0.74 or 913 km an hour and can be launched from vertical launch cells or deck-mounted launches. While primarily a long-range GPS-guided strike weapon designed to target stationary assets, Australia does have the option of purchasing the Block 5 Alpha variant, which adds a seek ahead for prosecution of moving maritime targets. If you'd like more quick rundowns of other weapons recently procured by Australia, feel free to let me know in the comments below. Taiwan has lived with the threat of invasion since the Republic of China's exodus from the mainland in 1949. And yet with the recent war in Ukraine existing as a case study in asymmetrical air denial operations, Taipei should be paying close attention. Taiwan faces a similar technological and numerical disparity with the PRC as Ukraine did with Russia. The Republic of China Air Force fields 400 aircraft in comparison with the 1600 fielded by the People's Liberation Army Air Force. With such a vast disparity in resources, Taiwan must adopt a strategy of gradual air denial that will attrit, plaf aircraft and deny China the ability to seize control of the island quickly. This will require the stockpiling of short-range air defense (SHORAD), long-range air defense (LRAD) and unmanned aerial vehicles (UAVs). Ukraine deployed LRADs such as the S-300 to devastating effect against the Russian Air Force, forcing Russian forces to conduct standoff strikes from Russian airspace or fly extremely low, leaving them vulnerable to manned portable air defence systems, manpad engagements. Australia recently purchased the Standard Missile 6 surface-to-air missile, here's what it can do. Back in August 2021, the Morrison government announced plans allocating $483.5 million to acquire the Standard Missile 6 Block 1 for its Hunter-class frigates and Hobart-class destroyers. And, with the Hobart-class destroyers slated for a combat management system upgrade to Aegis Baseline 9 in the Surface Fleet Review, these deliveries should be starting shortly. The SM-6 is an open source maximum range of 240 kilometers. For my Australian listeners, that's from Bondi Beach to Canberra, and for my American listeners, it's the wingspan of 120,000 bald eagles. It has a maximum speed of Mark 3.5 or 4,287 kilometers an hour, and a maximum altitude of 110,000 feet, allowing it to intercept ballistic missiles and, in a pinch, act as an anti-ship cruise missile due to its active seeker head. The SM-6 finally proved it was worth its price tag when, in February of this year, USS Kearney was confirmed by the US Department of Defense to have used one to shoot down a ballistic missile fired by the Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. To continue drawing useful lessons from the Ukraine with the ultimate aim of countering PLA and power, it's important to first understand PLA doctrine. There is a critical difference between the PLA's definition of air superiority and that of the US military. PLA commanders do not believe strategic air superiority or even short-term air supremacy is possible, but prefer to achieve local air superiority within a defined time and geographic space. This is likely due to weaknesses regarding joint fires integration and extremely limited airborne refueling capabilities compared to Western powers like the United States. China's doctrine and professional writings indicate that the PLA will pursue a decapitation strategy in the initial stages of an amphibious invasion to obtain local air superiority. According to the PLA's science of campaigns, China will rely on the PLAF and the PLA rocket force to execute long-range standoff strikes to attack, quote, critical targets such as enemy's command institutions, air and naval bases, missile positions and air defense positions, end quote. Make sure you put your thoughts on the PLA doctrine in the comments below. The other day I was reading through the Congressional Research Service report to Congress about the state of the Constellation class frigate because I'm a giant nerd when something caught my eye. 
In January 2024, it was reported that the delivery of the first ship in the program would be delayed by at least one year, primarily due to shortages of workers at Fincantieri Marinette Marines Wisconsin Yard. According to Navy's financial year 2024 budget submission, the lead ship had been scheduled for delivery in September 2026. According to the project's deputy manager Andy Bosak, FMN is short by several hundred people across both the blue and white collar workforce, welders especially are proving hard to come by. Fincantieri is using the $50 million they received from the Navy for the surface combatant industrial base to issue bonuses to employees both in the blue and white collar workforce. Employees who work on the frigate in the marionette yard starting January 1st, 2024 and are still employed on December 31st, 2024 will receive an extra $5,000. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. This March, the US Navy submitted their long-term shipbuilding plan to Congress, with some big surprises hidden in its 33 pages. These surprises include the 19 ships the USN has requested to be decommissioned in financial year 2025. These ships include the Los Angeles-class SSN's USS Helena, Pasadena, and Topeka, Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruisers USS Philippine Sea, Shiloh, and Lake Erie, the Avenger-class mine countermeasure ships USS Sentry, Devastator, Gladiator, and Dexterous, the Expeditionary Fast Transports USNS Spearhead, Choctaw County, Millinocket and Fall River, Whidbey Island class dock landing ships USS Germantown, Expeditionary Transfer Dock USNS John Glenn, and the obligatory Independence class that are combat ships on these decommissioning reports USS Jackson and USS Montgomery. These ships will be replaced by six ships in 2025, one Virginia-class attack submarine, two Arleigh Burke-class destroyers, one Constellation-class frigate, one San Antonio-class amphibious transport dock, and one medium landing ship. How conflicts in Armenia and the Ukraine changed how armies trained for war. Russia's special military operation in the Ukraine was not the first modern war to begin laying the groundwork for how armies trained for future conflicts. The Second Nagorno-Karabakh War in 2020 did that. With many commenters noting the effectiveness of UAVs in both reconnaissance and strike roles, bringing a new level of transparency to the battlefield, more familiar to players of real-time strategy games than staff officers in the command tent. Artillery also returned to its rightful place as king of the battlefield, as the prevalence of EW countermeasures and manned portable surface-to-air missiles made their early elimination more and more difficult, with the aforementioned UAV recon making their shells more and more deadly to any infantry caught manoeuvring in the open. The conflict in the Ukraine has since served to reinforce these lessons, at a scale the entire Western world is struggling to keep up with. Armies the world over now train with the expectation they are always watched, that digging a foxhole brings life and a sudden lack of artillery shells or EW support brings swift death.